everybody, I'm Sam Inkney, your archer. Today I'm going to be showing you how you can paint this beautiful gold bird. This wonderful sunshine bird, which is a little yellow finch in a flower we call rapeseed here in the U.S. I don't know what it's called globally, but I, I think it's the basis for canola oil. They're really wonderful, and they're um, uh, grown all over the world. I just think they're one of the most cheerful flowers. On the mic is my husband, John. Hey, guys. Hopefully he's less tongue-tied than I am today. Hmm. My uh, tongue be nope. tied. It's tied. <laughs> it's one of those days. You ever have one of those days? So, I do. Uh, he's going to be tracking me with the cameras. We have several of them, and the purpose of all those cameras is to make sure that you at home are able to see every part of what I'm doing so you can duplicate this yourself. The whole purpose of this channel is to get you painting for yourself at home I, and especially for beginners. Like we love getting you guys on board and on painting. If you want more information on the materials that you saw at the beginning of the video, you can check the description below, but especially the website. There's a lot of extra information on the website that you're going to find really helpful. It's really going to help you succeed at doing this adorable painting. This is acrylic. This is going to be fun. We're doing a three hoot. Are you guys ready to look at the canvas the materials and jump right on it? Yep. I bet you are. Slap on in there. Okay. So let me put little Mr. Gold Finchy Finchy face to the side. And I have a nine by 12 artist panel here. Now what's wonderful about an artist panel is that um, they are really easy to store if you're painting a lot. It's an alternative to working on acrylic paper. They're not better or worse than stretch canvas. They're just a different surface that you can work on. Um, I get these little packs at Michael's in economy little sizes that come in like five, and it's, it's a pretty good deal. They're ready to paint. I like to put wishes on my canvas, so I have the wish for a great home for velvet that's close to her kids. A uh, happy belated 10th birthday to Theodore. Happy birthday, Theodore. Uh, strength through loss for Cecile and her longtime friend who is crossing over. Healing for Glenn on an arthritis. So I certainly hope that flare up dies down and you find that you're feeling much, much better. Um, Sarah is wanting to send love to her dearly departed grandfather. And this one was really close to my heart. Safety for Amy's husband who's currently deployed come home safe and sound and to be okay. Now let's look at our materials over here a little bit. So I'm going to be starting out with the ground and I'm going to be making phthalo turquoise. Phthalo turquoise can either be purchased uh, pre-mixed for you in the tube or you can just simply mix phthalo green blue shade and phthalo blue green shade together and then add a little bit of white. So it's pretty easy to do. These are the brushes I'm going to be working with today and what I'll say on those, I have a variety of sizes. But what I really love are these Cambridge brushes. They're a mix of boar bristles and synthetic filament. So they're one of the few brushes in this type of brush that holds up really well to acrylic paint. I've got my ruby satins here in a variety of sizes. And I'll probably be using a lot of these in one little detail brush to get all those tiny little details in. That's the little complement of brushes I'm going to be going with today. But let's start out with a number 30 bright. Now, to get this mix, I'm going to put out right up front here because I don't want to be reaching deep into my space. See a little plop of phthalo green paint. It's yummy goodness is all squeezed out. Another little plop of phthalo blue paint. Yummy goodness is all squeezed out. And then a good little bit of phthalo white right here. I mean not phthalo white. There's no phthalo white. That's not even a color. <laughs> Titanium white. Titanium white is a really wonderful paint. Um, it's great for artists. It's one of the first paints I recommend that you upgrade into professional level of paint because as the quality goes up, it really makes a big difference. Now I'm going to use something called an artist knife, or you'll hear those referred to as palette knives. And I'm going to use this to mix together thoroughly these two colors and incorporate them into this. You can get these at most places that art supplies are sold. This particular one is from my line and you'll always know them because they're red. <laughs> So I'm taking one part green and one part blue and mixing those together. Now, if you are one of our wonderful uh, Australian friends, one of those wonderful artists, then you will probably be familiar with this as Southern Ocean Blue in the Matisse line of paint. So you can see I just have a little bit on the bottom. I'm going to pull out some of my white and mix this in. See how we're doing? Yeah. 
Now, here's what you need to know as a beginner or maybe a confident free hoot beginner is that the color shift for this particular ground is very noticeable. And when I say color shift, what I mean is that the paint dries a little darker than what you painted on wet. All acrylic paint has color shift. Student paints will shift more than professional paints, but they will all shift. And this is just one of those places that you'll see that shift more than others. So I'm looking to make a fairly light value of phthalo turquoise. Just wipe that off on my canvas. And I'm going to start painting that on. Now, in my opinion, it takes about two to three coats. Uh, draw and you paint it on and then you let it dry and you paint it on to get a really great matte beginning. So I'm going to dip this brush into my water, just the edge of the bristles, I drag off the extra and I load up. Now I like to load by flipping the brush and that pulls a lot of paint into the belly so that when I'm painting, I get a lot more paint on my canvas per uh, application of brush stroke. It's just something that helps me out a lot. And it's a weird thing that if you're not really familiar with brush construction, you might not know is a thing that you need to do. Tickly noses today. You have tickly, tickly noses, noses today. How are you doing, babe? I'm okay. Are you? I'm, are they okay? I, I think so. It's right, you know right. I'm I've been all hands on switching. All so, hands on switching. All hands on switching. <laughs> we have some more <laughs> buttons now in the I, studio as we keep trying to improve our art education a couple um, more huh we have a couple more today a couple more a couple more all right so you can see this is pretty good even at the one coat range but um in the original piece i did do several coats and i found that it just kept it looking very nice now i don't expect people to draw that's not an expectation I have. That's an art skill that you can learn. You don't have to learn it before you paint. You can paint before you draw. Um, just like painting, it's something that you can learn uh, sequentially. And definitely when you're ready for it, jump in. But sometimes it's intimidating to new artists. And so I offer traceables. You can find those for free on the website. The link's in the description below. But you can mm. just go there. But this particular class, as we're getting ready for Acrylic April, our amazing daily painting challenge, um, I want to start introducing the idea of gridding to you. So, bum -ba -dum -bum -bum, let me pull out my already gridded painting. What? Yes, I'm Martha Stewart. -ed. <laughs> so, if you'll notice, there are squares put on this canvas. One inch squares. Let me see if I can show you the reference. And on the website, you will find this available to you. This is the reference image with the same one inch squares placed on. Now, what this is going to let you do is freehand in your painting and get better spatial results. There's a lot more information on the website about how to make this grid if you've never done one before. Um, and definitely, I did a couple layers here. What you're going to really do is you're going to be like, you're going to count out your inches, right? So, like this drawing, the central figure really starts around the five inch to the 10 inch space on the canvas. And you can just go down and go, well, I've only got a little line that goes here, and a little bit of his little neck comes right here, and another little bit of his chest comes right here, and another little bit of him comes right there. And you can use the grids to help you place the objects in your canvas. Because believe it or not, um, it is very hard for your brain to keep space on the canvas. It's really doing quite a big, big thing. So this can be an anchor that really gets you through. I used a T-square, which is listed in the description below, and just regular little chalk here, this little chalk guy to get this in. And I use chalk, and it talks about this on the website, because it's easy to remove from the canvas. So that's something we're doing. You could also use one of these little chalk guns. Now, I'm going to take a quick question because I know some of you guys are painting along live and you're going to want to catch up a little bit. And then we'll turn around and start putting him in. You ready? I'm going to turn around. Down. Oh, One. Okay. Hold on a second. One, okay. two, three. Whoosh. And there you go. So uh, I really just wanted to drink some coffee is really what it is. Oh, is that what you Gritted want? Gritted canvas. Woo. Any well, questions about gridding? Well, there wasn't a question about gridding because they haven't come up yet, but there was a question that I was going to... The delay. <laughs> I was going to refer to the Facebook channel. But mm -hmm. since, you, since you've since you offered 
Could you explain what's going to happen in April? Um, in April, I don't know why I'm a crazy person like this. I, I don't know if you're aware, but there's a really lovely monthly challenge called Inktober where um, a fantastic artist put out that you do a daily doodle in ink. This caught on, and then they've got World Watercolor Month and Doodle Wash and all these different monthly challenges. And I was like, man, I want one for acrylic. Uh, a friend of mine suggested that I do it, Ian Jackson, and I thought it was a really good idea. So I did. It's Acrylic April because it ain't no joke. <laughs> I know. I'm so but it's a daily painting challenge, and there's a whole group for it. We're going to meet every day live to do a challenge. But I also have just 30 prompts for those of you that are ready to paint without a tutorial. It's open to any artist. It's open to YouTubers. It's open to bloggers. I invite any of you that are on Acrylic Art Journey to participate. Because if anything is going to help you grow your painting, it's painting more and painting often and painting small. So for 30 days, you guys and I are going to get together. Those of you that do that with me, you're going to come out of that 30 days changed, transformed artists in a way you cannot even imagine. I've done this before myself. I know exactly how transformative it is. We're going to have the same paint colors for the whole month and the same size canvas. Mm. So it should be really, really fun. And it's free because, you know, I'm crazy like that. Who does a monthly daily challenge for free? I don't know. I do. That's no. who does it. Me. Dolores had a really good question hmm. that I think isn't really one that we're going to be able to answer live because it involves some maths. But she was going to do this on a 16 by 20 and wanted to know how would the grid grow if you were going to scale it up? There's a mathematical equation. I will grab it for you and add it to the web page. So that we'll you can we'll see put that. that in a link in the description down below, which yeah. will bring you to the website where yeah. you'll find all that cool stuff. I'm gonna have to add that after because I, I I didn't I just I just did it for you. But uh, if you want me to do math, I'll have to go grab it. Uh huh. We'll Not a live John activity. Is, okay, here's the honest thing. John, who's very good at the math, is going to help me give it. That's what's gonna happen. Okay, but I will. All right. And it's totally doable. This is how you scale up or scale down or do murals or do any of that. And is it now? Keep your perspective. <gasps> That's my cup. You no, know, it's my cup. It's my fi yeah, that's my that's cup. my red panda. My cup. Okay. I have the ember. Okay. okay. <laughs> mm, ember. Okay. So now that we've fallen down the little door corp rabbit hole that we do, that's us. Doop doo doo doo. Okay. I'm ready if you're ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you guys ready? They're ready. Dried your drawing, ready, ready grid, you're ready to go in? Let's yes. start painting this little sucker in. Now, initially when I did this painting, it was for an ATC for our um international supporters in our crowdfunder and i did it quite small atcs are two and a half by three and a half inches and it really really changes as you get to paint a little bit bigger so you might notice that this painting is perhaps a little more refined and considered ah, and no no out. you're in it ah, what, what? You're, shh, shh, shh. oh shh. sorry okay <laughs> could you pull it towards just a little bit um, no, wait. Oh, that's right. You're fine. I'll just roll. I got the camera. I'm uh, just at the edge. I think I can do this. You're good. Is that good? Yep. Does that help? Do, do, okay. Do, do, do. All right, guys. I don't mind doing that, babe. No, I just don't okay. know how much desk space you have. Now, I do have zinc in the paint colors here. And the reason that I have zinc is because sometimes you need a very transparent white that lightens your paint without changing the hue. Hue is the exact color it is. The value that it is, is how light or dark it is. And so titanium white is, is very powerful stuff. And it can actually change the hue of your paint. Like it'll go from red to pink real fast. So if I add a lot of titanium white to that, I'm going to get kind of a peach going. Peach. And so that's why I have that in there. If you were wondering, why is, there, why is there zinc white and titanium white? Zinc white is a wonderful thing to have. And yes, it comes in a student grade paint for those of you that are budget minded. I have a whole file on my Facebook group of all the companies that have all the colors that I work with, so that or the ones that I really endorse, so you guys can know where you can get it. But don't think it's got to be expensive. This is the zinc white. I'm using the M gram uh, paint at this particular time. I really like them. They're a Canadian company, so shout out to our Canadian friends. Our Canadians are best. A. A. I'm sorry, guys. I did that. I did do that. All right. I so. We're going to start laying in the background. The background needs to be very soft. It needs to be very close in value 
to our ground that we have here and we want to push it back and we want all soft edges. So it's going to be a lot of soft dry brushy stumbliness and it's my favorite thing to do. And we're going to start with a very, very, very light color. So I'm going to take my number 10 silver Cambridge. This is a bright and it's got the mix of bristles and synthetic filaments that I like so much. And I'm going to go ahead and get just a smidge, just a bit, just a little amount. Move this out here so I have these all visible to me in could, a way that I really like. Christina, Christina was real quick asking, could she use mixing white instead of zinc white? Yes. That's Pretty okay? Pretty much essentially the same. Okay. Um, I thought unless, so, but Unless I it has a different pigment code, but even then it still essentially works the same way. Now, I've taken a little bit of my cadmium yellow, and I've added some of my burnt sienna to it. And you can see that I'm working it into the edges of these bristles, right? It's not thickly coated. And now I'm adding a bit of my zinc white. And you can see how it really stays essentially the same color, but it's just lighter. And I'm going to come here into this section, right here into this area of my grid. And I'm going to just on the corner of this little brush, I'm going to just enjoy me some wiggling. See how we're wiggling? Wiggling. There it goes. Now Let's you're not a little concerned. wiggle up in the third square up there. You're not concerned that this chalk is going to leave marks on the canvas, on the uh, surface? No. No. I'm using uh, an inexpensive kind of pastel chalk, and it comes off with, the uh, brush just in like you just get a damp brush in clean water and you just pull it off. I'll show you at the end how I pull it off. But won't it make my blacks whiter and chalky? I, you know, definitely follow the instructions on the website. I would do it lightly. Don't, don't press hard and leave a bunch of pigment on your canvas. Yeah, but, but we don't need purpose... to be too afraid of that though. Huh? You don't need to be too afraid of that. Not too afraid, no. Be aware, be present, but you don't have to be too afraid. Now I'm going to add a little bit of my phthalo turquoise into this little mix. Can you see this here? Yeah. So this is going to help it sort of blend into the background sky because it's just a little value up from that. You're going to see this kind of right here. Kind of nice to do. Just work that in this little erratic area. I'm going to come down here. And maybe let's put a little, little bit of that right here. Oh, that's I like to just give myself a little rape seed that's in the distance, all soft and out of focus. Hmm. So a little right there. And again, you can get exactly, exactly using the grid every brush stroke. And I know for some of you that is a very attractive idea because it can be really challenging to level up from two hoots to three hoots. A little more of my pigment in. Here. And just doing it very lightly. You can see that it's just very, very light. Let's just go ahead and lightly add. Got I have some views I gotta work on in my studio. Oh yeah? Yeah. How stuff lays out. Uh oh. Oh what was that? A that's little some... black got on my brush, not sure where. That's it's probably dirty... when I was moving things. So I'm going to just oh. very carefully. You just erased it. Take a clean brush and take it out. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Comes up pretty well. Nothing like a dry canvas. You just got a little fleck of black from there. Yeah, it's a little fleck. The black's a little too close to my zinc, and that's what happened. It's just bad paint placement on my palette. It's always an interesting challenge to find a way to make sure that you've got good spatial paint placement. Let's come here. We got a little yellow. There we go. See how we're just getting this very light background? Oh, yeah. Now, if it's hard for you to think about the layers of a painting, the other thing I have on the website is a sequential photograph step by step of every layer. So you can grab that and then look at the layer because it'll show this layer and the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. And that way, if you find like, oh, I'm you're feeling maybe a little bit lost in the painting, you can find your way back easily. And you can see this first layer I'm doing is quite light. Get a little bit of the burnt sienna. 
I save the cadmium for a little for the up close flowers that I want to be quite warm. A little oh, bit of the phthalo. That's also helping with that uh, force pers- perspective too. That's right, the atmospheric perspective. Yeah, that's it. So in landscape painting, right, we have the perspectives like you would think of in drawing perspectives of parallel lines that are receding into a horizon line and that kind of like foreshortening. But we also have really cool elements like the atmospheric perspective of the way things look muted and distant in the in the far off background or the way that um, colors will become more saturated or dark as they move forward towards us. And so we can play with those things in our painting. So that and a little more of this. I'm just trying to make sure that this initial color is close to that background sky color so that it has that distant feel to it. But you'll notice it's not green. Yeah. Not green. Not green. So how are you feeling being back in the studio? Honestly, I'm loving it. I missed everybody, but I, I you know, it's like uh, you, 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 you aren't teaching for this amount of time. Then you start questioning, like, did I ever teach? <laughs> and everything did I in ever the studio? know how to do this? I don't remember. And I know that she's suffering because, like, all the stuff in the studio is in a different place, and it's like out of whack. And we're all just trying to find how do we get comfortable and where are the pieces? And I, I don't do well when you move my stuff. No, it's that's so, the worst. See what happened there? That's a bad. I. To make things viewable on the camera, I often have to do very bad paint placement. And so you, you want to be able to space your stuff out a little bit more. Yeah. You know what I realized we're going to do? Mm. We're going to move that camera. Put it on the other side. Okay. Just because you're like having to turn all the way around to like look at people when you could just, if it was on the other side. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just go next show. It'll be on the other side. See, we're still working out some We're of working things. it out. Working it out. And sometimes some, I'll, I'll sometimes reload I, and I think it'll be nice to kind of come up here and be like, oh, yeah, I've got some. And so you can use the grid if you want to see how much. And it can also help you see shapes. If you break things down, sometimes if you take things in in their totality, it can really overwhelm your brain, especially when you're trying to train it to see things with the artistic mind. But tools like this can be anchors to help. You don't want them to be crutches. Right, but you do. It's okay to use a tool as an anchor or an aid to help you, as long as you're always trying to move yourself forward and find new ways to accomplish your goals. You'll be okay. All right, you can see I'm just very lightly getting this paint out. Zinc is my friend. If I did this with titanium white, it would be so powerful, and it wouldn't have that nice receded feeling that much of this does. Mm. And I want it to have a nice receded feeling. I'm putting a little receded feeling right here. Seed back. So here we are in the first part of our wonderful, wonderful distant flowers. And you can always even just, so you can go like that. And I know I'm being playful, but I just want to show you that those little marks each start to register to your brain as a flower that's just a little bit out of your focus, just a little bit out of your eye line, further and further back. All right. Let's keep building over here. So as I move forward, I can add more of the cadmium yellow to my mix. I'm going to put a little more burnt sienna into it. And I'm going to really be a little heavier with my white. And you're going to see that this is now kind of like a highlight. So This would be maybe where spots of the sun are catching different petals. And highlighting this wonderful distant blue. There's a little bloom right here that's coming off the stem. Let me bring this in here. Strengthening that up. Fun to strengthen this up. A little more white. More yellow. Okay. Fun for me. So sometimes I like to just think about where would a little bit of light be caught doesn't take a lot and a little can have a big impact how's everybody doing with their little happy yellow bird really good so and 
Can you guys see that I'm catching the edges? If you imagine that there's sun coming in, I try to think about the round shape of the flowers, right? These are kind of a round bloom with lots of little micro blooms on them. And I like to think about how the sun will catch some of those petals at different angles. And I try to reflect that into the painting. Got a little esoteric there, but it is what's happening. Might as well lean into it, right? Yeah. So over here, we're going to pick up some sunlight. We like sunlight. Don't we like sunlight? Yeah. You can even come in sometimes and take the yellow oxide and your, your cadmium yellow and mix them at a halfway point between each other. I have too much paint on there, so I'm going to kind of wipe it out and then get back into my color here. And I'm going to add some more, a few slightly darker. These, these could be the shadow elements on these little distant plants. A little bit of that bring its way through. Coming here. Always finding the way to start to tell that story. You can see I'm filling it out down here. I love how these brushes just take so much abuse. Huh. <laughs> like one of my favorite brushes in the line. And honestly, I just I just think they're just wonderful. Be Frank or Betty. Can I be Joe? <laughs> I'm doing it. I don't know. I'm just adding some of these little values in into these distant work. It's very hard sometimes on backgrounds that have a out of focus space in them on the paintings to realize how many layers might be involved in creating the certain look of something. Wonderful little space there. Now, down here at the bottom, we're going to start darkening some of these because they're sort of more in shadow. So what I can do is I can take a little bit of my brown. I can, interestingly enough, add some of my green to it. Can you see how we're doing? Yeah. I'm going to just very lightly start to talk about that deep shadow. And if I need to, I may pull this to the side to improve my angle to the piece. These, these are more up close. They're deeper into the mix. I'm really pressing into the canvas. You're wondering how hard am I pushing? I'm pushing very hard into the canvas. And I'm trying to preserve little bits of sky that will be showing through. So a little bit of the green. The reason I like to put this green into the burnt sienna is that there's a hidden complement in those two paints. Um, the burnt sienna is actually quite red, and if you put red and green together, it will gray and brown them out. And so this will allow this to be a less saturated, bright color, because it can it can get a little it can get a little overwhelming. Now, as I go forward, I'm going to go ahead and work a little bit of my yellow into that. You can see what it does. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So these are just deep down into the base of the flowers. A little bit of my cad yellow into that mix. I, I'm not rinsing out often, am I? I didn't. I noticed that. You just seem to be using that br same brush with lots of paint in it. Yeah. I'm going to just, a lot of it's going to be done with this brush. Push those into that space. They're deep. There we go. 
really work the edge here. We're gonna now a fun thing that we can do is we can come get a little bit of the cad into this, which is really quite of a surprising little shop. And make sure that we put some of that into our downward mix. I can get my yellow there. By letting these colors intermix and using a limited palette like this, there's a unifying effect. It can be really helpful to us. I'm still trying to think about what light's getting through. And just enjoying the painting the tops of these out of focus, fun little oh. flowers. Now, when you're doing a lot of work like this, eventually the paint just starts to dry on the brush. You do have to rinse out on occasion. Get back into here and just get a little more of this sort of muted green, a couple places. I don't want it to be heavy. Just want to show that there's just some of this just below where our little bird is perched in the thicker growing area of it. And this will peek out here and there as we layer up. So it will be helpful to us. As you can see, it's quite light. We want to be careful when we're using bristle brushes to avoid foaming because there is actually a tendency of this paint to foam. What, is, what do you mean by foam? Make little bubbles? Yeah, it makes little bubbles. <laughs> really surprised if you've never seen it before. You'll be like, paint what? <laughs> it paint does that? Paint does that. And a lot of times you won't see that uh, in the techniques and tutorials that would show that because they time lapse that out in this really hard to witness way. Mm. All right. Now I'm going to come back up into here. But to do that, I, I kind of want to put in a little bit of a step. I want to put in some distant little stem work that I'm going to start adding some stuff to. To do my stem, I'm going to actually use one of my very favorite brushes. This is a half inch angle brush, Ruby Satin Short Handle. You can get this in a long handle, you can get this in a short handle. What you want to know about long handle and short handle brushes is uh, if you're sitting at a table, if you're painting in bed, if you're painting in your kitchen table, short handle is your better option. If you're standing at an easel, long handle is your better option. All it means. I'm going to load up with my wonderful burnt sienna. I'm going to grab a little bit of my black paint and make a nice sort of dark little color. Now, with the shorter end of the brush facing up and the longer edge of the brush facing back, I'm going to start to put in just a little hint of a little step. I'm here at an angle. Oh, look at that. That's very light. A little stem there. I want them to be sharp and twiggly. Make them twiggly. You wouldn't want to have them not be twiggly. And you can see it's just a very light effect here. You can do light little implicated stems just here and there throughout the painting, right? And let's talk about maybe a little too much paint on there, and I want to go really light. Up here, I'm going to be very light. And I'm going to be light with my pressure because I want the stem to seem a little far away. Now, there's going to be a friend here, a little heavier. What? Bring that up. And open that up to some space. We know we're going to put a lot of little flower there, don't we? A little stem out there. You can use a small detail brush if you'd like. And whatever helps you get through. Little distant wiggles and bits. Wiggles and bits. 
Now, our focal stem, we're going to be right here because we've got to give ourselves flower that Mr. Goldstein is just giving him a little stuff. All right. Got a little bunch of stems in. Yeah, hey, a little bunch of stems. Happy it's, little stems. Well, one of the things that's that's harder is when you're doing. I'm gonna make a little little. I'm gonna, pass I'm gonna show here. you guys. I'm gonna remove some of the grid where I don't need it because I really only okay. need it right around the finch at the moment. So look how easily this comes off. I'm gonna. I want. I want everyone to just have a little look around, because you know when you're when you're trying yeah, to get yeah. at the painting, you have to move around a lot. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you, you, you know, we can't see when you're like making an angle or doing something. So it's good that we can take a little step back and see how some of these come together. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And, and that's why I've started the step-by-step -step photographs. So you can see each layer. So you can go, oh, this is this layer. This is this layer. Because in the speed of the painting, it might be overwhelming. That way, you know, you guys can watch it, see that step-by-step. -step, and then when you go to paint it, you're like, I know how to get through. It's yeah. bigger than anything in your success of art is just knowing the layers that you're contending with. Yes. Mm, I love my background. I love background. my background. I love I my do. background. That's what I get to look at. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay, back into our very fun flower painting. Okay. Which is our favorite favorite, right? Yes, actually... Joe said this is one of his favorite paintings you've done in a really, really long time. It's one Thank of his you, like all-time favorites. Thank you. That means a lot, Joe. I was like, oh, that's very nice. I've grabbed just a little bit of CAD and some of my um, thing. And I'm going to just add another little layer. I'm just making sure that these stems have some paint on top of them so that they're a bit layered in. Put this darker, more saturated color. I don't want to get too heavy with it because if it gets too heavy, it'll overtake my painting. And I'm gonna start here. Let's go here. We're gonna make a little. We're gonna make a little thing. So I'm gonna take some of my CAD red and I'm gonna put it into my brush. And you can see I'm working it back and forth to get a light dust in. And then I'm gonna come into my yellow. I'm gonna work this back and forth. You can even tone it a little bit if you need to with the yellow ochre. Now, let's think about the shape of this. This is our dark shadow value of this particular bloom. Maybe some of it comes up here. Isn't that wonderful, that glow? Mm -hmm. That's why artists work with cadmium. I get asked that all the time. If cadmium is potentially dangerous if you ingest it, um, why would artists paint with cadmium? So here's my two reasons. First one is I don't eat my paint. So it's not so much of a problem for me. <laughs> and then I don't breathe it. I don't set fire to it. I don't use torches near it. That's just not stuff I do. So it's not, it's not a health concern that I currently have. Um, and I wash my hands after I paint so I don't eat and, and stuff. Uh, also, it's very, very glowing. It's just a gorgeous color. And there really isn't um, a color that's quite the same, if that makes sense. It does. It just it's it's a very unique color in our paint lines, and every once in a while, artists we will find a paint that we really really enjoy. I'm going to make a little puff of flowers right here. We'll find a we'll find something that we just think is wonderful, and then uh, they take it away from us for varieties of reasons. <laughs> And then you're like, what? I like needed that. <laughs> Which is why there's still lead paint in oil paint. Now, I noticed that some countries, they take a much more um, industrial science <laughs> approach to artists. Yes, like, they do. <laughs> they're like, they expect you to know what you're working with. and But they also expect the, the manufacturers provide those really detailed scientific uh, like MSD sheets and well, stuff like I, that. I would say that's more of a U.S. thing. So the problem with buying art supplies outside of the country, so like if it's a product that's only sold in another country, you may not get the safety labeling that you need. And you always want to read your safety sheets. It's always provided with a product. And you just read that and you just make sure, like, 
does this have any fumes? If it's anything new that you're not really familiar with, read the safety sheet. It will never hurt you. Yeah. And remember if they say uh, um, no known causes as for expected use, if you read anything that says for expected use, then stop and think, did they ask, did they expect me to use this product this way? Because it's entirely possible that they did not test the product for what you're doing. So it can read as it's totally safe because nobody imagined that any crazy person would do what you're about to do. Right. So if you're being experimental in your art, if you're you know out there trying to see uh, what you can do, be sure that you're thinking about, am I using this in a way that the manufacturer might not have expected me to, to use it? Mm-hmm. Like uh, acrylic, people don't expect you to heat the paint in a significant way. That is not expected to so here I am, I'm going to come right here. You can see I'm giving him a nice bright, 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 bright volume. And give him a nice big flower to have his little life on. Little boom can come up here. Fun. You can come down into that. Come in front. Why not? So you can see I'm using the orange as the deep value on my bright bloom. You could use your brown. I just like the saturation of the color to help me pull things forward. A little dark down here. I think it's important to have little shadows around where you can. And you can see it's still yellow. It just has a slight orange cast to it. All right, pull some of this right here. If you lose your blue sky, it's nice to keep that color to the side so you can put it back. I had to in uh, one of the versions of this. I was like, oh, my goodness. Now, I realized I need some I need some stems right there. Do you? I do. I need to not push the wrong button. <laughs> so I'm going to just real quick grab my half inch angle and load up some black and brown on it. Just real quick. And just make sure that I have given myself some uh, little, little stems to grow a plant on. You would want. Go oh, wrong button. Right there on Again. the toe of the brush. Let's see if I can go over there and make it look better. Fun to add little stems. I can't help it. I'll stem it up. You would do. I will stem it. What you doing? Stem I'm as you do. Stemming it up. That's what I'm doing. I'm stemming it up. What are you doing? I'm following the Sherpa. Why would anybody do that? Sherpa tracking. Sherpa tracking. It's like squatching, but it's chirping. Yeah, so just as artists, you are responsible for studio safety. Um, sometimes I'm hard on uh, other teachers, not for their skills or, or any of that, but for are they relaying unsafe studio practices? Mm. Because I don't think it's okay to wantonly endanger students. <laughs> wantonly endangering your students? Yes, it's wanton endangerment. It is. If you <laughs> just... don't read the safety sheet and you recommend a technique that is potentially cancer causing, it is wanton. If you're instructed. You know, you know what I'm saying? I, I do. <laughs> my soapbox. Everybody's got one. That's mine. Don't kill your students is one of my soapboxes. <laughs> this is why really... I say to you, don't eat paint. Maybe you didn't know that. Don't eat it. Some of it's super poisonous. Doesn't go in your body. Perfectly fine on the end of the brush. That's super safe. Safe here. Safe on the end of the brush. Not safe. Not safe in here. Not safe in my lawn. That's all. And and we do our best to like stay up on all of the latest info. Yeah. And there's some great resources out there for that. So yeah. And if you're ever wondering something, one of the great free resources is the Just Paint blog by Golden Paint. Oh, yeah, that is a good one. They, they work with the Safety Commission, the ASTM, and they work on standards. And if there's a change in anything in the art world, they publish it the minute anybody knows it. So, good resource. It really is. There we go. I feel like I've got nice shadow values there. You do. Nice shadows on my the wonderful The shadow painting. flowers. Shadow. Shadow. Okay, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm going to go for it. I'm going to add just a little bit of the yellow ochre to my cadmium yellow. 
I'm pulling it into the mix that I already have here, but clearly this is a slightly lighter value. And I might add some of my zinc to pull up, again, a lighter color. And I'm going to start to tap. Think of these almost as clouds. I like to pick little clusters and highlight those little clusters. Highlight your cluster. I'm going to try to make sure that these are very up and down little flowers. And I lo love the sound of that. The sound when I hit the brush to the canvas. Now, for acrylic April, we won't be using any cadmium stuff. Yeah, why is that? Uh, it it took down the expense of the project quite a lot. We're mm. going to be using um, uh, actually uh, very good but less expensive reds and yellows. And also because so many little brushes um, are going to be doing the, the paint with us uh, for their homeschool. So I just didn't want any chance of allergies or just anything, anything, anything to, to, to be a concern. Especially if you're going to, you know, I know we're going to be painting with large amounts of kids. I don't recommend the use of real cadmium pigments. Hue only when working with children. Mm. And hue is a great way to save money. And uh, now that Liquitex has fixed their formula, uh, everybody has a pretty good hue. That hue over there. That hue over there. I think that was a little shady, but it's true. But anytime you read hue on a paint tube, what it means is it's not the pigment. It is a color that they mix that's close to the color of the pigment. Gotcha. Right? Because it's, it's, you're, you're not going to get like a real Prussian blue or Indian yellow. Nobody knows what the actual formulation for Indian yellow was. A mystery. <laughs> I'm just pulling this lighter value right here. See how I pull this forward? You can pull that forward. I feel like this has gotten a little round, but okay. I can always push it back with a little bit of sky color. The trick is, is that I want to have nice negative and positive spaces in the composition. I want bits of sky to peek through. And again, you can always come back in if you feel like you've lost any sky with your sky color. And so you can peek it, peek it through. back in and go, no, 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 be a weirder shape. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Little sky color lets you push it back. So if you felt like you did anything that you didn't like, this is how you just use your sky color. Come back in and push it back. And sometimes it's nice to push a few of those in there to just imply little keyholes that maybe you weren't able to get in the initial painting. Rinsing, rinsing, rinsing. Here we go. We're going to start to have some fun because we're into the cadmium now. A little zinc in my cadmium, and it's just my cadmium. You've stepped in the cad now. I've stepped in it. Little fun fact about artist cadmium is it's coated, so it's not like industrial cadmium like you would see for like street signs or industrial work. It has a special coating. Some of the oil companies even claim that you could eat it if you wanted to. I'm going to still go with don't eat it. But it's nice that they took the effort to make it safer. <laughs> and it doesn't absorb through your skin. But that doesn't mean you can't have an allergy to any art product, no matter how non-toxic it is. Pigments are a real deal, as many of the people in the makeup industry just discovered last year. <laughs> I just follow a few makeup blogs, and they're like, this is a pigment. Press pigment. I'm like, oh, boy, people are going to have allergic reactions. And what did they had them just as, like almost as soon as I said it. <laughs> It's gorgeous. It just, you can have an allergy to any pigment. Because think about it. It's like it's minerals from the ground. They're different chemical compositions. Yeah, makeup is some complicated skin dye or yeah. something. I mean, it's better than it used to be. Uh, Napoleon died from green. So 
from the yeah. green paint that they insisted on having. And they knew it was super poisonous, but they just didn't want to lose the color in their housing. They're like, I don't want to live in a world without green. And it's like, okay, but, you know, super deadly. Mm-hmm. So it's not a new thing that we as artists and as species have to think about. You can see I'm just doing the same. Isn't that wonderful how they just see the little petals that have caught the color? And they are reflecting in the sunlight as need be. A little more down here. Remember how I said titanium white is powerful? Shall we use the power of titanium? Yes. Isn't that like a song? Hmm. I feel like titanium is in a song. I don't know. I'm going to make a very light value. I have to think about that. I'm going to come here. It needs to still be yellow, but I want it to be just the titanium white and yellow. And I'm going to catch a few little areas. Be precious with it. You know how I'm always like, don't be precious? Be precious. So be like Gollum and be like, my precious, my precious. Be like Gollum. That's not good life advice. <laughs> Obsessed and live in a cavern and murder your friends. This is not good life advice. <laughs> He's like a cautionary tale, isn't he? Yes, definitely. He did not go to Jared. Two people got that at. Two people got that joke. Five people gave me a down thumbs for telling it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that disturbance in the YouTube force. <laughs> but see how we're just finding these little spots? But they'll give you a thumbs up for acknowledging your acknowledgement of the poor joke. Uh, you know, poor but jokes two, are going to happen. But two people will give me a thumbs down for mentioning that you're going to give you a thumbs up. And thus, the circle of love continues. It really is. Bad news, guys. All thumbs are positive engagement as far as YouTube is concerned. <laughs> it's a fidget spinner for you guys. This gives you an outlet. Okay, there's an extraordinary amount of psychology that goes into the YouTube. It's true. User experience. And to improve it. Mm -hmm. They it do care. Like, there's been a lot of discussion. I didn't mean to grab the zinc that YouTube doesn't care. Oh, man. Um, but they actually really do care. It's just so a big. Lot. There's no way to manage it. It's, and it's so hard to, you know, to telegraph that personal care that they put into things because they're trying to make it fair for everyone. And to do that, they have to kind of make it the same for everyone, which makes it very difficult for them to telegraph how much they personally care. But they do. But they do. Care. They really do. You're a YouTuber and you're feeling like YouTube doesn't care. That's not true. The, they're just facing a problem of size and scale. They can't keep up with what's happening on the platform. There's no manpower that can handle it. They've got a the algorithm has to handle it. Big robot hugs. Big robot hugs the algorithm. Don't demonetize me, please. <laughs> well, robots are now helping our studio. That's true. We have robots. John's going to give the keys to the robots overlord. It's like he never watched Terminator. No, no, that's not how it works. They take them from us. I bet people who've been here for a while are like, oh my gosh, are they on Elon Musk again? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to take a, we're going to take a little minute at are our we? mentality and just talk about where we're at. Where this are is a we? good time. Oh, Whoop. hold on. Read that one? Back in my hair. Okay. This is a good time to evaluate your project and to step back from it. And look at it. Anytime that you can walk across the room and look at your painting and evaluate, I can look at you're going to see things in the painting that you just simply can't see up close. Uh, one of the things that I discovered when I was first teaching art um, on YouTube was that it's very challenging to talk and paint, and it's very challenging to be up on the painting the entire time and paint because you can't see it. And I had grown up in a very quiet, serene space where I could paint. And uh, been able to walk back and forth. And so that was the thing I had to learn how to do. Um, I can promise you it's very uh, effective to just walk across the room and look at your art. Mm. Another thing that's effective is to go into the bathroom and hold your art up and look at it in the mirror. 
that will explode your brain. The stuff that you can see that's a little off with it that you couldn't see before. Or if you can't do any of that because you're not mobile and those things aren't possible, take a picture on it with your cell phone. Mm. Works very well too. There's always a way to sort of get back and evaluate. It's always good to be able to do that. How is everybody doing? Good. I miss my palate. You missed it? Do you miss it or do you miss it? I have the overpowerful mister. I need my little micro mister. Power mist. Power mist. It's a bigger studio. You need a bigger mister. Right? So hopefully the grid, as you're going, you can print that out. You can grab that. It's helping you kind of see where objects are. Um, You do eventually move into a space where you can kind of spatially put those out and get them in and be good. But when you're starting out using tools like traceables, like grids, they help you overcome those initial obstacles to painting so that you can get painting because nothing makes you better at painting than painting. A lot. Often. All the time. Mm. Which is why I don't charge because you've got to go buy art material. Well, you know what Flynn says really about the grid. I like that. It's looking very yellow, very happy. It is. <laughs> Are you guys okay? Do you have any questions before I turn myself Let's around? Let's see. There's a uh, I, I, Miriam earlier screamed, what about cobalt? I saw that earlier come mm. up. Don't oh, need it. Who's on your shirt? Oh, that's Frida Kahlo. Oh, yeah. If you don't know Googler. Good. Especially if you live in pain, Google Frida. Mm-hmm. Um, she is one of the great artists of her generation. She was a very holistic artist, and then everything about her life went into her artwork. It's very personal. But in that personal expression, it ended up being a very broad conversation about life and what it means to be alive uh, in the face of challenge. Interesting artist, tremendous painter, love all the work. Yeah, that's pretty Frida. Cool. Okay. Uh, oh, cobalt, don't eat it. It's not good for you. <laughs> Manganese, don't eat it. It's not good for you. Okay, I just sort of broke my brain. I, yeah, I guess so. Shouldn't eat paint in general, but you, cobalt is a good paint to use? Yeah, you know, any of the pigments are fine. You can use lead white. It's fine. Right. If you're an oil painter, the issues with lead are not about painting with it. The issues with lead are about doing something you're not supposed to do with it in relationship to your time in the studio. As long as you use basic studio safety, it's a non-issue. It doesn't jump off the brush and get into your face like a face hugger. No. But you want to wash your hands when you're you don't want to eat if you're using paints that are dangerous. If you're sanding, you have to use a mask. You know, if you know you're using pigments that could be uh, detrimental to your health, you want to use a mask. You don't want to heat the paint. Uh, it's like an incre- it's like an incredibly low temperature to drier temperature. If you look at most of the safety sheets about uh, heating acrylic even to your dryer, it starts releasing formaldehyde. So you're not even supposed to sit next to your dryer when you're setting your hand painted T-shirt. Mm. It takes very little heat to start releasing uh, VOCs in paint, and then a little more heat and it starts exploding the particles and then they become very light and heavy and they get in your lungs and then they do. Nope. Don't set fire to it. Before we move on from Sorry, that. It's, I know it's my, it's. Uh, no, no, you're really good. Could, could you show real quick that shadow value that you mixed over there and just how to, what that ratio was? Cause they're just didn't quite understand how to get the shadow value you put. Oh, up there. the deep color. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let's go and get into that again. Okay. Okay. So guys, and I think I have uh, this canvas, which I can kind of show it to you, because I'll be just sewing over that. Oh, okay, cool, perfect. When we're trying to get the shadow value, right? So what we're doing is we're taking the phthalo green, just the tip of it. See, it's just on the tip of my bristles. And we're coming here and we're working it into the burnt sienna, right? And that gives us this sort of green-brown space. See how that's going? Deep. Right? Now we can pop a little green into it to say, oh, there's a little bit of the the foliage down here. And if you want, you can get a little bit of your red into it. Look at that. A little highlight. And then you can also get a little bit of yellow into it. Pull it in to the whole painting saying this is just some of these flowers down in the deep shadow. Hopefully this is helpful. Yeah, that and by keeping all those colors in that sort of, you know, transitional range, it really makes your eyes see depth, huh? Yeah, that's what you're doing is you're just trying to use color, uh, the nature of colors being warm and cool, 
in value to create depth in, in, in that space. Add a little zinc white to any of that. And you can create light value, see? Without changing the basic nature of the color. Hopefully you can see like light value, light value, light value. Yeah, that's what we did. I can see it. Is that helpful? It is. That's very okay, helpful. Cool. I want you guys to win at this painting. And to that end, let us paint the painting. So okay. now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of lay in my birdie bird. And I'm going to use a smaller little brush. I'm going to use a number four Cambridge. And I'm going to do his darkest color. I'm actually going to put him in quite dark. Okay. 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 I'm going to okay it. So we're going to, he's mostly off of this center line, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my black, 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 and my yellow. Not what you expected, I imagine. But that's actually the basis of it. And I'm going to start putting him in. And you can use the grid if getting him in um, freehand is challenging, right? But basically, if this is the center line, right, his head rocks between this center line and that. So I could be like, all right, we've got a little head here. Right? It comes up a little bit, and then there's a little bit of a beak. I'm not going to get too into the beak because i got to use a tighter brush to get that, but I can kind of say. I know that some of that beak is there. Right. Then you come down in a little chin. You've got a little bit of his back. I'm going to come here. Bring the head and chest there. How much of him is in this square? So even if you don't draw a bird, right, you can definitely draw him. He's a pretty simple shape, and I like to pull the tail straight down. Now, my flower went a little bit high, and I can either leave it high like that, or I can take one of my brushes and my background color that I still have left and pull it down a little bit. See how I can do? So that I have that nice blue space, which was uh, really lovely in the design. See how I'm doing? Yeah. And I'm making sure it's kind of like, ooh, fun. Now I've got a little bit of room for his little bit of legs. I paint him in with this dark color. Which is the yellow and the black. And this is really his darkest color on him. There'll be a couple values that are just a shade or two deeper. And you can make him fluffy. You can make him fatter. I'm not going to be, like, insulted by that. You can be the bird that you want to be. Be the bird that you want to be. If you want to be a bird that's kept in someone's backyard with a, with a big bird feeder that's always making sure that your bird is a happy, plump little bird, then that's okay. But if yours is a fit wild bird, that's okay too. Yes. Your bird I'm, is... I'm glad that you have so much bird self-acceptance message going. <laughs> I'm going to take this tail down and I like to just take it down straight. I like the big fluffy birds. Nice little tail going down straight. Sometimes I have to dip my brush into a little bit of water to improve the flow off of it. And you can see when you do that, it sh you can get a sharper edge where you need it. Also, you can see when you get a little bit of water in there, the yellow that's actually present on the brush. Now, I am going to put on my vision enhancers because mm -hmm. I need them. You know how you can always tell when there's one of those. Those. Oh, yeah, I'm going to let you take this in. For those a are second. great. Yes, very cute. They match your background. They match the background. 
They do? They do. They match the flowers. Yay. All right. You know, I you can always tell when it's a backyard bird because they're a little fluffier, like backyard squirrels. <laughs> now, I'm going to do a little pre-work to get his little foot in, right? So I'm going to come down here to this part of his leg, and I'm going to come out with it's a, like a black line. I'm going to bring it down to maybe a quarter of an inch. And then we're going to come forward. And what I'm going to say to you is important on the legs is that they be delicate. Bird bones are delicate. So I'm using a script liner to get this fine line. You could use a quarter inch angle. You could use a small detail. Whatever, whatever gives you control over what you've got going. Right. And I'll, I'll even give him a little bit of a drumstick here. When you thicken up the upper part of the leg, that's actually kind of a drumstick. Now, they were asking what kind of bird this is. It's a finch, I believe. I, I think it's a Sherpa keet. A Sherpa keet? No, it's a real finch. Like, this is not made of bird. This is like, like a bird person should be able to identify this bird by the picture. I was very careful. <laughs> I kept the markings and the shape and everything. Actually, someone did, did call it. They, they thought it was a, a, a lark. Oh, it might be. Okay, a lark. Sounds good. All right. Now, he's got this very delicate little set of bones that's gripping the flower. So I'm going to bring this out. And it's easier to thicken the line than thin it. So my two cents is oh. be delicate. Goldfinch, I guess is what you said. Yeah, I think so. Goldfinch. That's what I thought it was. Uh, yeah. Although I can call it a Sherpa Keat. Yeah, you'd like to. If that feels necessary to you, go ahead. I feel better. <laughs> I'm going to bring a little back, little back toe here. He's gripping, right? The trick is just to be delicate about it. Center toe here. Come down. See how light and delicate these little, little crazy little. It looks insane at first. I want you to understand. That the feet don't look great at first. Don't be upset about that. That gets better. I'll thicken just this part up at the foot very delicately. Your little little clausies there. Little bird clausies. And then right here, coming forward, we're going to give him another little leg. And I may have to push things out on that blue, that little flower right there. Remember how I said we might have to paint it out? Mm. Oh, where is that brush? There it is. What brush is that? Oh, it's just a, I'm just grabbing a brush. There. But which one did you get? I grabbed a number four Cambridge. They gotta know. I'm using the script liner. Inquiring Sherpets want to know. There we go. And I'll get back in and fix that uh, as we go. Will you? But yeah. But I just want, I want those legs to have that space. It is important, that little blue gap. That little gap. Yes. Oh, so you can see the delicateness of the leg. Yes. I can see how important it is now. Otherwise, it would get muddled. Very muddled. Oh, you don't want a muddled leg. You don't. Beak too. Beak. I'm going to go with black. Now on his little head, I'm going to bring that little line there. His little beak is going to come out. Now bird identification, let me tell you, these beaks are a big deal. You can't get too off on it if you're trying to do this for somebody that's a fan of this bird. Right. If you don't care about that, you're good. I'm going to bring this back a little bit, this line back. But a beak can mean the difference between a crow and a... And yeah, a, it's huge. And, and a, a raven. raven. Yeah. Or sometimes a pigeon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you got to gotta be careful with those beaks. You do. Because a bird says the bird is a word. The bird, the bird, the bird is a word. Bird, bird, bird. Bird is a word. No, I... He actually goes quite fast once you get his basic 
his basic self and his basic his basic birdness. I'm grabbing a number two. I just want to clean up a boo boo that I have here. Look at that. Very easy for me to clean up any boo boos that I might have, isn't it? It is. Now, while he's having a little rest, a little dry, you can come back with your yellow and your titanium white and just make sure. Where you at over there? Oh, there you are. Okay. With your flower is what you want it to be. Oh, that's how you... Make it kind of stand in the flowery. Yeah. Well, see, we don't get upset about the little stuff. We just paint it out. I'm not saying like in life I don't get upset about little stuff. I am human. I'm just saying in our canvas. Mm -hmm. Our drama on our canvas. All right. That is looking good. Now, while you have him here, if your legs are dry, you can go ahead and grab a little bit of your white paint, a midge of your black, because you don't want it perfectly white, but you want it quite light. And you can come here very gently. Ooh, put a, a little, little highlight. highlight. Yeah. Highlight's a big deal. You know that pulls the little leg together? Yeah. There you go. Now his little highlight really helps the delicateness of his leg. It really does. And you can see why I need my glasses to get that little sucker in. Yeah. But now that I've discovered I can have two glasses like this, I don't mind wearing them. I mean, like, I, maybe I, zoom I, in there. You can really see. You get some. That's You can get some detail with that. You really can, man. Actually, that's really helpful, that zoom. <laughs> is it? Yeah. I was like, wow. There you go. Reference photo. But that's just an incredible amount of detail you're putting in there. It is. It's a bit. I know. It's some extra. Now, the rest of him is going to be done between my little Cambridges and my little number two. I am going to do his beak. I'm going to grab some of that gray. And it's okay if it's that yellow gray because there's a unifyingness to that yellow gray. I don't want it to be super duper light, but it needs to be the upper half of his beak needs to be a little bit. Light. Yeah. I'm going to go across here. Make sure. There we go. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to get a little bit of my darker black and yellow. And I am going to come from here just making sure, a little darker than that, I'm going to have a little bit of this shading here to go under. Let's bring it around the wing. We'll have to probably bring it back even some too, but this way it's in there darker value we're going to be playing with in a minute. Let me know where that is. And I think it can be nice to get a little bit of the black yellow to black. And even with this number two, come gently down the back of this tail. Let me get back over there. i on the wrong. Hold on a second. Trying to keep oh, my head there out you of go. Way. Sorry. Sorry. Trying about to that. keep my head out of the way. All right. I was on the other camera, sorry. So that's some of the weird little detail work that I can do early to get a good result. And then I'm going to take my number four and number two Cambridges to get the rest of him in. So let's begin with yellow. Yellow. We're going to layer it up. It seems very dark right now. Oh, yeah, he should. Is that okay? Yes, it needs to be this dark. Now we're going to come through the head. And he's got his little markings right here. We'll pull it up there.
pull that little bit of feathers off. Really? There's a little bit right there. In that far leg. Definitely, we're going to want to start to take some of this in the wing. You can kind of see how it goes. I'll grab a little bit of that yellow. And then back down here again. Look at that. Build, build, build. Pretty good, pretty good. Let's keep working this. And add a little more yellow into that mix. And I'm going to start doing this little, see this like sort of touching and pulling stroke? Mm -hmm. Touching that and pulling that. Because we know we want to talk about these little feathers. I press lighter here where the shadow is. Those brushy strokes really do make it look like feathers. They do, don't they? I love this brush for that. Now, would you say that the brush helps create that technique? I would say the brush is super helpful in this. You can get it with anything. I've seen people do this with finger painting. So don't feel like you can't do something. Now I'm going to add a little brown into my black and yellow mix. Warm it up a bit, but I do need it to be dark. Right here. Just make sure that we've got this extra little. Right there at the tail. Little shadow under the chin. And we can start to layer up into his little upper head here. So that's going to be the a little bit of the yellow into the black, but not too much. And we're going to start adding some of the white. Now here, I'm going to definitely let the back of his head have a little bit of feathering. See how we do? Just implying that. Rinsing, rinsing, rinsing. One more little bit of this yellow black. But now I'm going to put just a smidge of the red in there. See? Just a smidge. I'm not only lightening it, but I'm warming it. Come right here. Little light highlight right there. We're going to come here and just take some of these feathers into where we know the wing is. Our biggest amount of highlight we're going to be doing is coming out here on this outer edge. There's another little highlight kind of right here under the wing. There's one a bit right here, somewhat down the tail. Top of the wing. And we're going to come at a diagonal down. A little bit right there. Because we're starting to talk about it. Rinsing out. Now, a little bit of the yellow, smidge of the cad red into it. Smidges. That's not a smidge. That was a scotch. Arbitrary Sherpa references. All right, a little zinc. It's That's a scotch. A scotch. couple smidges. All right, let's start. Here we go. We're going to start adding these little highlights. 
right here. Just come through here. You can see you just build these layers. Just lightening it up. I'm going to switch to my smaller Cambridge, or you can use the corner. Either one is fine. I'm going to get a little of my white and black, the gray. And you're going to come here and you're going to put a little dot there. This is the little black and white pattern on the wing. You can come back to a darker color if you need to. A little bit of just cadmium. We want to really make him yellow. Now, up here, bring a little of this yellow up. And, and this one's hard, get a little touch of it on the outside. Pulling this down, dabbing the paint. Cadmium. Get a little highlight right there. Just a bit on the tail. Up the wing up top. A little bit more. I want to just put some little wing feathers. Now we're going to do a little bit here. That would not be me spilling my coffee. You didn't, did you? Nope. You okay? Uh, yep. I'm just trying to, like, soften his values, make sure that I've got shadows here, I've got the highlights where I need them. Now, here's where he's going to pop. First, I'm going to take a little bit of my pure yellow and my titanium white, avoiding the blue. This is my much lighter color, right, of my yellow. Put a little bit right there. Definitely a little bit right here at his cheek. Another little bit at his cheek. Right focus here. He needs a little highlight. Top of his little wing. Doesn't he look good now? The little yellowness is just starting to come together, isn't it? It's looking really good. Now the next thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to grab the, the black, but we want a lighter gray-white than what we've initially put on. So we can highlight inside these little feathers just a smidge. And you can always come back with your yellow to help define any part of that wing if you're feeling you need to. 
We're going to give his head a little shape. Right here. Come back and make it some gray. It could be just a little bit right there at the back, but not much. I'm going to get into my smaller brush. I'm going to grab my light gray. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come along the beak. And then I'm going to put in a little nostril. Can you guys see a little nostril highlight? Oh, yeah. A little reflection highlight coming down into the tip. And then I'll pull this part back a bit. We've got to start doing the eye. So his eye will have this little light run of feathers around it. Once I get that in, and just a light little run of feathers, a little light highlight right there. Another little one at the nose. You're using a script liner there, I'm yeah? I'm using a script liner. Use any detail brush you got. You use any detail brush you got. I need a slightly darker gray than when I'm using a pop for the lower beak. But I don't want to take out all the dark. Now, while I've got all this out, I'm going to get my just pure black. My nostril highlight in. I'm going to go ahead and paint the inside. This eye. You guys see that? Yeah. I'm going to grab my number two because it gives me a lot of control and I can work just the edge. We're nearly done, guys. I'm going to make a gray, but it's a pretty soft gray. I'm going to go ahead and pop just a couple little reflections right here and up over the eye. Come back with these little dashy strokes. On the corner, you could use around if you don't have control of your brights. It's like a little, almost like a little crazy eyeliner that he's got underneath here. A little collection of light feathers. Like he's a member of an '80s hair band. He has a bit of that going on. He has a bit. He has some feeling <laughs> about what he's got going on. Now I'm going to get a much lighter color. It is tinted with a little bit of the black in it, but it's much lighter. Some of these feathers will be marked lighter. Not all of them. Some. Back into my script liner. Bring out some of my light color. Inside of the eye. Then tap out a forward reflection. There you go. I'm going to sign with some of my gray. And then I've got a. I'm gonna dry this, and I'll show you how to clean off. Oh, okay. The chalk. So usually we sign it, we finish, but this particular time I'm gonna show you how to clean off the gritty. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's easy to clean off, but I just wanted guys to show you that it will work. All right. Now. The trick to this is that the painting has to be dry. So I'm going to real quick dry the painting, and then I've got clean water and a soft brush. Okay. 
So, man, we just had, we just had a pretty busy show today. So I wanted to say thank you guys. Really, really love having you by, having you guys by. It's our pleasure to be able to do this with you guys. And I want to just say thank you from the bottom of my heart to making it possible for us to do this. Um, you guys coming and painting along and showing us what you guys do and helping let us know what to do next. We love you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. Oh. I was just saying thank you for everybody. They come and make this possible for us. They do, man. What are you there doing there? There is no us. So I've just taken a clean brush. It doesn't look clean, but it is clean. And I'm taking clean water, and I'm very carefully removing the chalk. Oh, yeah. So here's what could mess you up. You use a wax-based chalk, like an oil pack. That could really mess you up. Mm. Or a wax-based anything. Like, like a crayon or something? It's better to use the kids' chalk that we'd use on a chalkboard and then to upgrade into a fine pastel, yeah, a fine charcoal, because you know it's not wax-based. Chalk always removes if it's just chalk. Pastels always remove if they're just pastels. They become hard to remove if you do those grid lines with too much pressure. Like you just work the pigment into the base paint. That could be a problem. Or you have dried the paint with a warm hair dryer and then put the chalk on it. <laughs> because your paint has just gotten soft and you've just put pigment into it. That can mess you up. Or you've used pencil, something staining, a dark color, not a light color like white. Those are the only ways that it's going to mess with you. But you can see it removes. And then what you're left with is quite, I love my glasses. Do you love my glasses? I think they're okay. so cute. Quite a lovely painting. Oh, there you are. Ta-da! I think that looks so cute. So here's the deal. Hopefully you painted this. Hopefully you're like, man, I cannot believe I birded. I yellow birded. It is fully three hoop. What three hoop means for you when you're painting regularly at the three hoop level is that you're almost ready to let go of tutorial, right? You're, you're ready. These are the places where we put all those art skills together and they come together in like a little composition and you'll start to see how kind of like Mr. Miyagi wax on wax off turns into a whole karate defense. But it's a similar concept. So if you find like, wow, this was a little bit hard, this is like you're just doing a really challenging workout. You're still going to get the benefit, the art growth, the art skills. So never, ever be judgmental or hard on yourself, especially when you're brave enough to try painting. And I mean, who doesn't want a happy little bird? Be that's good great. to yourself. I just said that's great. I love you guys. Be good to each other. And I want to see you at these. I really see. It's easy, plus it's a lot of fun to 